Yeah, for me, I think I'd wish I'd gotten into investing a little bit earlier and understanding all of that. I could have easily gone through life having never been taught about investing or had access to understanding what that is. There are so many people that I know who will never understand that. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Mr. Money Jar Show. This week, we welcome Gabby Mendez, the host of the Talk 20s podcast, we have a fantastic conversation lined up for you. We talk about her previous experience as a teacher. We talk about how she grew her own platform and podcast from scratch. And we also talk about the role of financial education in schools, which is a topic we're both very passionate about. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. So I look forward to you listening to it. You're tuned into the Mr. Money Jar Show. It's showtime. Abby, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Timmy. I love our chats. I feel like what the chat that we had on the Talk 20s podcast was amazing. So I'm excited to chat to you on your yeah, podcast. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. And it's great to be able to return the favor. And yeah, I, I love our chats. I wish we had them all. Yeah. <laughs> um, just very, very quick intro for the listeners. Could you tell them what Talk 20s is about? Yeah, absolutely. So I graduated from school and university and like many people got flung out into the real world of adult life and was like, hang on. Nobody teaches you the stuff that you really need to know about adult life. I'm sure a lot of people can relate who are listening to this. So, you know, all throughout school, every, school is often about, you know, academia and getting certain grades and, you know, that kind of stuff. But life skills, generally not really covered that much in the curriculum. We might have a little bit of like PSHE or citizenship, whatever you want to call it and stuff like that. But it just wasn't taught enough, but it was the most crucial stuff that you needed on the outside world. So I graduated from university in education, went into teaching, realized this huge gap that we had in the industry and was like, I need to do something about it. And so I came up with this concept for Talk 20s, which was initially going to be an event when we first started, but COVID hit. So I had to pivot my idea and launched the Talk 20s podcast, which has now gone on to have like over a hundred episodes, amazing guests like yourself and stuff. And we talk lots about, you know, the different life skills that are needed. So we talk about our four pillars of content, which is finance and money, which is obviously what we were talking about when you came on. Finance and money, career and business, well-being and relationships and fun and adventure. And those are the four things that we think are just so important to kind of navigating adult life, but we don't learn enough about, you know, what's what to think about when we're entering into relationships, what to think about when we're stepping into the world of work for the first time. So we want to talk 20s to be essentially a hub for all of that information. And yeah, that's a little bit of an intro. And those four pillars, interestingly, are they're, they're super important, mm -hmm. but yeah, they're not like typical academic subjects. Mm -hmm. There isn't a subject at school that teaches you how to select a partner or a husband no. or a wife, for example. No. And I don't know what that might look like, but I wanted to ask two follow-up questions to what you just said, which is, mm -hmm. do you think it's the role of school to teach those sorts of things? Mm -hmm. Or do you think it's the role more of people like yourself who are entrepreneurial and want to build a platform? And do you like why do you think we're not taught those things mm -hmm. when, when we're younger? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, I, I wish I didn't, there wasn't a need for my business. I wish that we were more successfully equipping people for the world of work, but I know why we don't. And I think it's probably easier to talk about the reasons why we don't. Like there are a lot of, our schooling system is based on a very archaic view of what the world looked like. And it's very difficult to overhaul and change that. I actually thought that more changes would be made from something like COVID coming in. That literally changed the whole world pretty much overnight. It made us way more digital, but like lots of the world, and we know that from our data days, lots of the world's gone back to normal. And a lot of that is the case for education. There might be some software that they've brought in to, for people to do their homework online mm. or to be able to do stuff like that. But ultimately school days look very much the same. And to educate a w massive population, you pretty much kind of have to do that. So school is built up in, in that kind of way. Then if you bring in the whole Ofsted system, you're going to get very like... Oh no, here I'm here for it. But like, then if you bring in the whole Ofsted system, like schools are basically graded on how well their students do, obviously. So you might, they have a cohort of GCSE students. Your teachers will be put, you know, set targets or put under pressure for their students to get X, Y, Z because the ultimate outcome of the school then feeds into the offset um, results. And then all of that coming together will get funding. Your schools will get funding based off the back of results, mm -hmm. where they sit in leadership table. And then when your parent is choosing which school to send their child to, they will look at things like, offset oh uh, is this school graded outstanding is this school have like you know amazing activities and all this kind of stuff are they getting really good grades they are what will measure it and then 
they'll get a certain amount of applications to that school based on that those figures mm -hmm. and then schools will get funding per head basically from the government so the better your grades are the better your offset off their qualifications the better the facilities you have is going to likely equal more students are going to apply you're going to have more of a cohort you're going to have a bigger budget to work with that's what schools want to do right if they start implementing more of the life skills the less tangible stuff great for the students but probably harder to then keep it afloat with things like budgets and things like that because you know maybe things like GCSE marks don't become so important and all these other things so they have a responsibility and there's part of it in the Ofsted kind of criteria but ultimately it is about achievements and outcomes so I think because we have that kind of very strict structure that happens within schools it then means that it's really hard to find those times for life skill moments where we can add in like lessons and stuff like that that being said and I'm sure we'll talk about it later in the podcast but Rishi Sunak obviously wanted everyone to carry on studying maths all the way up to 18 and I think there's a lot of argument that we should be studying financial education and some people would suggest that there's a need for people not to know that knowledge because essentially the people who would benefit would be the banks if you're taking out loans and stuff like that the people who win are the banks in those situations so yeah. if you're less good with money you're more likely to borrow um and pay interest and pay interest yeah. exactly so there's a lot a bunch of reasons why i think the school system is just not set up for it first of all and then doesn't follow through doesn't follow through for it, even though it would be a really nice and we can all see the really nice positives that it would have so that means the people like you and i we step in to plug those gaps and that that's why there is a need for us. Yeah. Hopefully the listeners, um, <laughs> you're getting a sense of why me and Gabby love our chat so yeah. much. The reason why, and uh, do correct me if um, uh, you, you don't agree with this next statement I'm going to make, but the reason why Gabby was able to give such a detailed answer there is because Gabby was, but I'm going to say like is a teacher mm. because it's like you are in the classroom, you're yeah. still teaching people, but you're doing it via a platform I rather am. than yeah, via, yeah, a, so, yeah. via a school. So that's why Gabby knows so much about yeah. that stuff. Yeah, I taught in a school for two years. So I did a degree in education. Uh, it, was, it was like education studies. So like it was a lot more about how we learn as humans, the politics behind education and all this kind of stuff. That's where the kind of the understanding of all that kind of stuff comes from. And then knowing what I knew about education, how it was based on archaic ways and stuff like that, I then got, I then stepped into the teaching world. So my, I'd already kind of stepped into a teaching world where I kind of knew why it operated in this kind of way. And I could kind of, it was like my blinkers were off. Mm. So I immediately was like, why do we work in this way? It's absolutely stupid and can, can understand all those kind of things. So obviously I taught for two years, but I could literally see what was happening all around me. And it, I could make a really clear observation. I was like, this just, I don't think that me as one person in one school as a as an NQT like I was can make a big enough change for what I would like to see in, in the school. So I stepped out of it and then guess you can say I'm still teaching, but in my own way. Yeah, in, a, in an almost global classroom now. Yeah, um, Your, your reach is that. potentially global. Um, so yeah, this is super exciting conversation. Mm -hmm. So this, yeah, one of the pillars on your podcast mm -hmm. is uh, money and finance. Mm -hmm. This is the Mr. Money Josh show. So the next question that comes to mind for me is, did you teach your pupils about money at all? Or did any of your colleagues do that? Mm -hmm. did that did that come up? Mm -hmm. Well, I, in my second year of teaching, was given a form of sixth form students to... You know, I was literally just stepping... I'd been obviously one year in teaching and then I was in my second year. So I was like 22... 22-ish at the time, they were like 17, 18. Why I got given this form, I do not know. <laughs> I literally, I used to dress like a grandma because if a, a, a supply teacher or another teacher used to come into the classroom, they used to not be able to see, recognize who the teacher was in the classroom. Oh, right, right. So obviously, I just blended in. Yeah. So I literally had to dress, I had this like blazer, like, <laughs> and I was like, so I tied my hair up in a way that people would be like, that's definitely not a sixth former. Yeah. Just so I could literally like, uh, like have some authority because I was so nervous mm. and I felt such an imposter. I was like, like, how can I be responsible for like, it's only a small form group of like 16, 18 odd students, but still like, I was like, what can they kind of learn from me? And I actually think that like, they probably learned more from me being the age that I was than they, they would have done from like a teacher who felt that kind of distance and like they'd forgotten what it was like. Cause I still very much remembered what it was like to be in their shoes. So they also asked me questions that I'm certain they wouldn't have asked other teachers. Like, you know, what's the difference between credit card and debit card? The simplest like finance. Oh, so finance you, you thing. get like, questions like that? Yeah, because we used to enter into um, conversations and they wouldn't feel 
em- like embarrassed or reluctant to have those kind of conversations because they were like, oh, you've literally like, you're only just the other side of uni miss. It felt like a lifetime away for them, but like I didn't like feel like that. So they they could ask me those kind of questions and there wasn't really like a, oh, like we're not sure because they kind of felt like, oh, you've just been through it. So it was kind of like, we could have much more open dialogue. Um, and so it was It was kind of like, we. I started to kind of thread it through. And I'm not going to lie, the school that, the second school that I was in had a plan to kind of integrate some kind of lessons into, uh, in, in some terms of like finance and stuff, because they were stepping out, they were all going off to university or going off to apprenticeships and stuff like that. So there were some presentations that were like sent out and like, this is what you're doing in form time today. Yep. And it'd be sent out and it'd be like, basic personal finance but we used to just get in a debate as a form was like what do you think about this what do you think about that what's your experience miss and it just used to spark a lot of debate so I loved those sessions so much so I kind of like take took on a bit more of like responsibility of planning those sessions and kind of helping them formulate what that looked like but I know that's not the case for every single school oh yeah I mean so don't mean they're like out any of the schools I went to but <clears throat> critical thinking and PSHE was just it was a mess. Yeah. <laughs> we just used to mess around for the whole hour. Yeah. And um, we even had, I think, a critical thinking exam. And I, I think someone in my year just like wrote a pretend essay for mm-hmm. it. Like he didn't even, and he got an E or something that yeah. it was taken that unseriously. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's tricky when there's not, I think I also did like some kind of qualification citizenship, but they kept saying like, it's not going to count towards your GCSE. It's yeah. not real GCSE. So like, like you said, none of us really took it seriously. And I have a question for you, Timmy, actually. Yeah. If you'd have been taught about things like mortgages, credit cards, loans and stuff like that, would you have really actually paid attention at 13, 14, 15? Because I know I certainly would. Yeah, it's a great question. And the thing is, teaching, I think teachers work incredibly hard. And I think that school actually does a great job if you look back, like if you're comparing it to what you think it should be, then you'll be, you'll find room for disappointment. But mm. I think, I hope I get the date right on this, but I think the idea of like kids being given a free education, state funded education mm. came in in 1870 or mm. something like yeah. that. So it's a relatively new idea. Mm. So the fact that everyone gets an education is in a way kind of a miracle because mm. if we didn't have that, we'd see the re- like the results of that. So that, that's not to say that it's perfect, but I think that what we have is like really, really good versus if we didn't if we didn't have it. Mm. When it comes to teaching people about money, it's a really tricky thing to do because on the one hand, you look at the studies, there's a famous Cambridge study that shows that people's financial habits are bedded, t- bedded in from as early as age seven. And so you're like, wow, like we need to be talking to them about money before that. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, People have financial milestones throughout their whole life, like getting on property ladder, like retirement and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so if you're speaking to a five, six year old about pensions and, you know, ISAs and that sort of thing, they're not necessarily going to get it. So I think you need to have, and uh, yeah, and this is why school can't do everything. I think mm-hmm. school needs to talk to the people at the age they're at for the life milestones they're at. Yeah. But then I think it's on people like us to then step in and then continue that journey throughout people's lives mm-hmm. when they start their first job, when they buy their first home. Because like sc- school can't do everything. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think that's the same for universities as well. Like there could more could be done in terms of like helping people through navigate. Like I think a lot of people are just given kind of personal finance and and um, like student loans and all yeah. of that kind of stuff. Like obviously young people are then at 18 trying to step out into the adult world. A lot of people's stories when they come to the podcast and they say, okay, what's the biggest like thing you have? A lot of people talk about, I spent all, I spent all my student loan in like a few months yeah. and stuff like that. Like what can we do at those moments is what I think is the education that we're missing from school right now. School should absolutely prepare you for everything up until you're going to university. Cause yeah, yeah people, they spend their whole student loan or they don't know what to do with yeah. it. You take out the bank account with the student overdraft. You spend the entire T of uni in your overdraft. I've spoken many times before about how I was so deep on my overdraft that the first pay slip that I got, my first pay, took me up to zero pounds. Mm -hmm. And you have this really insidious thing with overdrafts where you think it's your money, but actually you're a negative and then you get paid and then you have nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think school should definitely prepare you for how to budget, how to manage your student loan, how to manage the forms of debt you're going to be going into, maybe like 
getting a car or something. Mm. So the stuff that you're going to encounter around that that yeah. life stage. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. That's cool though. So you did actually, you were that teacher. Like I, when I think back to like being at school, the best teachers were always the ones that went outside of the curriculum. So that's mm. good to know that you at least had the opportunity to teach that. Mm. Um, when I then think about your education and you coming up, are there things that you wish you had learned about that you weren't taught? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... In terms of like create, I believe in like creating like the whole human um, and like the whole individual and developing them in all different kind of ways. And I think there are some things that I feel like I really benefited from when I was younger that if you weren't really like myself, you might not have benefited from. So for example, I was really into like musical theater and like the arts. Okay. So for me, I think like a lot of like a really great life skill that I've got now that has helped me so much is public speaking. Mm -hmm. I speak on a podcast all the time, mm. but I learned that skill through doing like drama. But a lot of people, when you see a lesson and it's labeled drama and you think, oh, it's Shakespeare and it's all this and it's that. Like a lot of people just tune out and go, but public speaking is a skill that, so many people should be taught because it's helpful no matter what job you do most of the time being required to speak in front of a group of people whether it's like in a meeting setting or whether it's in front of like thousands on a stage it's still a really really helpful skill and I think those kind of like practical life skills are the things that I think like I've navigated and kind of figured out for myself but I wish there was more of like a this is like a public speaking like lesson we're going to learn about how we do this because I think that was gives people the confidence to do to do more things like that so that's just like one example of many that I think helps create this whole individual mm -hmm. that gives them skill sets and, and loads of different things and then they can choose okay I really do want to do a job that is not 30 percent public speaking or actually like i didn't really enjoy that lesson but it wasn't because of shakespeare it was because i actually like feel like i it's, it's not for me or whatever it just gives it just gives people more of a scope of like what they could actually do when they then step out into into adult life yeah you speak to young people week in week out on your on your podcast about the topics that that matter most to that age group and something that i feel about the uk and the people that are in charge at the moment is that the priorities and life milestones of people basically under the age of 30 aren't given um, precedence at all. Mm -hmm. So if I look at the March budget, for example, and all the announcements that were given, there was stuff in there for people that were retired. There was stuff in there for people, people approaching retirement. There was stuff in there for new mums, albeit mm -hmm. we will help you look after your kids by 2025 so you can get back into work. But anything for people under the age of 30, there was like nothing. Yeah. And you would think that for a major financial and uh, uh, kind of country level announcement like that, you'd have everyone glued to either their TV screen or they'd be watching it um, live streamed on YouTube or whatever. Like people just don't tune in because they just don't expect that they're going to be told, oh, we're changing the LISA threshold or we're, yeah. like, we're doing this, we're doing that. And when I did some digging about this on the ONS and on the government website, I found out and I did a post about it that when you look at how the government makes most of its money, most of it's through taxation. Mm -hmm. And then two of the biggest forms of tax they make are through the direct taxes, like income tax and national insurance. Mm -hmm. And of course, the people who pay the most of that are the highest earning people mm -hmm. in the country mm -hmm. who are on average older yeah, of course. Um, and have Later been in, in their, their career. Yeah. So I just wondered if you like agreed with this take mm -hmm. and like, what can we do to prioritize young people mm -hmm. more? I 100% agree. And like, I spoke about this recently on a very recent podcast, but, and I'm quite open about it, but we applied for Innovate UK funding yeah. to launch 20s first. 50,000 pounds. We need to talk about 20s first as well. We do need to talk two. about it. But yeah, essentially it's an event where young people can come along. It's the, it's the bridge, it's the gap. So you've graduated, you come along to an event, you can take your next step in adult life, whether right. we talk about finances, career, and all the different elements we've spoken about taking place. You know, I've wanted to launch this for ages and I've just not done it. And I've been putting it off and putting it off and then try to apply for loads of different funding and innovate being the biggest one. And feedback from it was amazing. This would be a really great opportunity for, this would be a really good use of uh, UK government funding. Um, the, the, you know, there's so much opportunity here. I can see the need for it, all this kind of stuff. That's all the assessment coming back. Didn't get the funding. Mm. And it's really disheartening because I think a lot of it is to do with all of the things that you've just mentioned. When, you know, we are 
when we look at like finances and who we're helping and stuff like that, a lot of things come with big milestones. So it will be when you retire or it will be when you lose a loved one or it will be when you become a parent for the first time and you're looking at childcare. In your 20s, you're graduating and then it's literally like, here's the big wide world to go figure it out. Mm. And then the next time that you kind of feel like you step into like government support sort of thing, it is when you start becoming a parent you and not, a child, yeah. you like, no, not, not everyone in that it's getting even harder to like, you know, being able to afford to have kids and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people don't necessarily want to have kids. It just makes it really, really difficult. Who do you go to in that time? You either really have, need to have a really strong network. And when by network, I mean family who can help and support you and guide you in your right steps in your career or just really great connections. And so I think obviously this is another reason why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer because rich can tend to have more like connections and, um, you know, we can put you into, into this industry or that industry. And, and, and that's why there's the hugest divide. If we basically focused on making sure that people got an even playing field in their twenties and they could get access to the things that would help them move forwards, we would see less of that. But like, clearly, because we've put on a very strong application for government funding and didn't get it, clearly it's not on the government's agenda. Mm. So if it was, we would have got something like that funding. And there was all kind of excuses made like, oh, what if you're, uh, I think one of the arguments against was like, what if a major person in your business leaves? And I was like, that is a problem for all small yeah, that's, businesses. That's that is a unique, yeah. that's just business. Um, and then the second one is like the fund was specifically geared towards kind of helping creatives within the industry. Now, I'd argue that you and I are the new version of what a creator looks like. Yeah. Uh, so uh, essentially like the fund was essentially to help creatives and, you know, we'd have different speakers and it would all kind of that stuff, but apparently not enough linked to the creative industry for us to benefit from from this, which is why we didn't get it. But it's frustrating because I do feel like we are like pushing up against kind of a locked door from the government to basically say like, look, we want to help young people. We think we can through what we're doing. Help us and guide us along the way. But we're doing it anyway, stuff them. They'll look back and be like, yeah, wish we'd, wish we'd been involved in that. Absolutely. And um, we were saying like before <laughs> this episode started, like I know how tricky you're finding it, but... You just have to remember with this stuff, like if it was easy, then everyone would do it. Yeah. Like, yeah. If it's hard and it's working, then push through, be kind to yourself, mm -hmm. try to do it sustainably. But if you're, do if you're doing a hard thing, you're probably very, very small percentage of people doing that hard thing. And then when it works, yeah, everyone will want to be your friend. Yeah. And we want to throw <laughs> money at you. And you'd be like, where were you when I was? Yeah. Where were you when we were trying to get this off the ground? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's tricky, but like, it's a blessing to be in the position that I am. Like I absolutely wake up every day and I, I do my, most of the time absolutely love my job, but there are, you know, being one person with a team of people who rely on me, it's not, of course, like they help grow the mission and stuff like that. But I also have a responsibility to, you know, run this company in an effective and sustainable way. It's it's a lot. And like, I'm 28, so I'm still trying to figure it out for myself at the same time. So yeah, we'll get there though. And hopefully it won't be too many sleepless nights. Yeah, hopefully not. So yeah, you just mentioned you're 28. I'm, I'm 33. Mm -hmm. Although in my head, I'm still like 17. <laughs> um, which is something that happens as you get older. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if now that you're kind of reaching... Uh, the later 20s if there are things you wish you knew about money earlier on because when I look back there are just so many things I wish I'd known mm -hmm. yeah for me I think I'd wish I'd gotten into investing a little bit earlier and understanding all of that genuinely I don't think I'd ever I could have easily gone through life having never been taught about investing or had access to understanding what that is there are so many people that I know who will never understand that like and it's crazy that like that's something that you really kind of have to go out and teach yourself in a lot of spaces. So I think I wish I'd learned more about investing. I went through our own experience, myself and my fiance Dan, of buying our first home, literally clueless. Didn't didn't know what we were doing, had no idea. And like, it's great if, cause you know, if your parents have bought a house, there's a lot that can happen there in terms of, you know, them passing down knowledge and stuff like that. So I guess you can benefit there, but also times have changed massively when it comes to, you know, property is a complete, completely different to when it was when our parents were buying like however many years ago. So that's also like another whole challenge that kind of we had to step into and kind of understand like, is this a good deal? Is this good? Like, I think, don't know. So so many things on the house point and in terms of like you getting information from your parents that's so true a good friend of mine hope he doesn't mind me saying this on the podcast is renting at the moment he's always rented but him and his wife are looking for a house to buy now 
And because his mum has always been very entrepreneurial and very wealth focused, mm -hmm. he gets a lot of advice from her. And the stuff that the information that you get told when it's just a known thing is just mm -hmm. incredible to me. So she told him, when you're going to view houses, go with an architect because the architect will be able to look at the house and be able to tell you where you'll be able to extend it, things you'll be able to do to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there as someone who's rented pretty much my whole life up until a few years ago. Like, I don't even want to hammer a nail into the wall. Mm -hmm. But you're there being given this like really specific knowledge on house buying that you can use to increase mm -hmm. the value of the house and stuff down the line. And there's lots of different things like that, which, yeah, if you don't, you just don't know what you don't know. Exactly. I yeah. guess. A hundred percent. Um, when I look back to my early 20s, definitely investing is, is one of the things I wish I'd known about sooner. I first started investing into individual stocks and then I then moved over to index funds. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because people have quite a consumer focused view of investing. They're like, oh, I buy Apple stuff, so I'm going to invest yeah. in Apple. And you can actually just buy funds that contain all, the, all of it. Yeah. And this is going to seem... Um, it's a bit less kind of hard financy, but I wish I wish I'd known more about investing in yourself. Mm. Because I think when people think about investing, they think about like, what financial asset can I put this money into or who can I give my money into? Mm -hmm. But to your earlier point about public speaking, I'm also very, very big on public speaking. Mm -hmm. I think particularly when you're early on in your investing journey, if you're starting with smaller sums, let's say £100, if you get a 7% on £100, that's £7. But if you put that £100 into a course, a public speaking course, that is a skill that can pay you for the rest of your life. Very true. If you spend that money on healthy food, on like your health and fitness and stuff, again, that's improvements you're making to your body, which will follow you for the rest of, life, of, of your life. So I wish I had seen investing more in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, I have non-negotiable stuff. So I'll make sure that I eat well, that I sleep well, that I exercise and stuff. But I've only started to do that in my 30s. Really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think this all comes back to like money mindset. Like you and I have a very good mutual friend, Laura, who talks a lot about the whole mindset around how we've been brought up to think, feel and believe about money. So all of our money beliefs, like what are we actually thinking? Are we believing that money is hard to come by and therefore we're going through a lot of struggles in life? Are we believing that, you know, you can only get to this point in your career because of your location, your your background, your so many different things. Like there are lots of things that kind of tie into that that are just all come back around to the money conversation and how we think, feel and believe about money, which I think now that I've tapped into that through understanding, you know, talking to Laura and yourself and like that on the podcast, that's a huge thing that kind of just goes under the radar that we just don't really talk about. Mm -hmm. Are there things that you do in the present day, currently, like money tips and tricks, habits, um, maybe even like products or apps that you use to help manage your money mm -hmm. that make money management an easier thing for you now? Yeah, I think I use a, I use like a budgeting system okay. whenever I get paid. Obviously, it's a little bit different now because I'm playing myself like a self-employed person. So um, I think it's, you know, sometimes there can be different like, peaks and troughs and stuff like that. But now we're into to pay myself pretty much the same every month. Mm -hmm. So basically get my finances in, organize the things that are non-negotiable. So the things that always go out every month. So I share a bank account with my partner. Okay. We put a percentage of our money into there. All of our bills, our mortgage, all of that comes out in there. So that's like a, a money that puts in there. I have uh, something that I pay off with my car. I have investments that I pay into. And have a wedding fund as well. Okay. So all of those things are things that kind of need to and have to kind of go out a couple of bills and things like that. Then what I'm kind of left with is essentially what I can use for the month. So if I'm getting my hair done that month, that's expensive. Like, so I have to factor that into all of that. Like, um, you know, any other things that kind of feel like are important to me. And then obviously I have the, the, the fun stuff that I can then go and do. Um, I work with them, so I don't know if I need to say like hashtag ad, but I do use Zopa, um, a smart saver account to store all of my money that is like sinking fund pots. So my wedding fund is in there. My holiday funds are in there. Like everything that I store in there because you can gain interest. If I was to keep that in like a current account, um, it wouldn't be getting, it would be very unlikely to be gaining very much interest and therefore you're missing out on money basically. So I use, use Zopa and then um, I also use like Monzo to like, 
put like spending, like I use it like a spending card. Yep. So like my extra money that I've got, I put it into a different place so that I can literally just like tap, tap, tap away. And I can be like, okay, I know what my budget is per month. So if I've got like, you know, I'm going Harry Styles last night, I went to Laura, okay, like drinks can go on that card. And that's what I've budgeted for then. And then it kind of feels like I'm, you know, I'm in control of it. And I have that, I know you call it a money date. I literally probably, I wouldn't, I don't call it money date, but I, I guess I kind of do mm. every single month to kind of be like, that's how I'm organizing my money. If I didn't, I know that when I completely ignore my bank account after a little while, my life is chaos. Of course. It absolutely is chaos. And I used to live like that all the time. So imagine what my headspace was like. Like it's only really been like in the last couple of years, surrounding myself with great people like, you know, yourself and Laura and all the other financial experts that we get on the podcast that I've actually gone, no, no, this is the steps. But like, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't checked in on my finances for a little while. And I knew that like things were not in the right places. And I knew that this pot was really low because I'd spent loads without really expecting it and all this kind of stuff. And I knew that that was chaos. And my whole life was then chaos. It was actually crazy to like see how the rest of it kind of came out. And it was only when I sat down and went, okay, let's actually look at what this is. We can move money in from here, move from there. Okay, I'm fine now. I can move forwards. So yeah, I think it's so important that you do that every month. Yeah. Well, it's not just money. It's, act it's physics. It's a law of thermodynamics, which says that if you leave stuff, stuff becomes more chaotic over time if you mm -hmm. leave it. Or if you leave an apple on the table, you come back in a month, it will have become rotten. Mm -hmm. You need to expend energy to keep things um keep things going which is why it's very important that you make the things that you're doing to maintain stuff fun mm -hmm. so that's where the money date idea comes mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. like just take yourself to wherever it is you need to go whatever music you need to put on mm -hmm. do it with a friend whether it's monthly weekly or whatever so that you can maintain your finances because the people who look like they've got everything sorted are not doing anything special compared to you. They're just checking in more frequently. Mm -hmm. If they were to leave it, it would be chaotic too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Could bring the conversation back to Talk 20s. You've got the podcast, you've got 20s Fest coming up as well. But I'm interested in what the long-term kind of goal for it is. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. We're on this mission to kind of educate and bridge the gap between the next generation and the big wide world of adult life. So... Ultimately, we want to be able to get into universities to to attract graduates as they're leaving. So we can go, this can be your platform. Okay. And the way we kind of see that happening is continuing to grow the podcast. Like a lot of what we do, like sometimes we will have, we'll have experts like yourself who will talk about all those finance elements, but we will also have celebrities where they will tap into their life of what it's been like in their 20s. So, you know, it's a nice kind of story piece. And the reason that we do that is because we want it to feel relatable at all different points. Like we want people to feel like it's not like going back to school. We don't want to feel like this is a boring conversation to have. We want it to feel like this is so ingrained in just everything of our life that actually they tune in for as much as they do learning, as they do entertainment as well. So that's why we have all of that kind of involvement. So we hope that the podcast will just grow and grow and grow. Obviously with our four content pillars, we want hope to produce more content. So whether it's courses, if you're looking to streamline, or I really want to get better at uh, investing, for example, I've listened to Timmy's episode of the Talk Chinese podcast on investing. I've listened to Ryan from Money Saving, uh, Money Saving Experts, not money, making money making simple. Money all these uh, words, making money simple. I've listened to that. But like, I want to take the next step. Maybe they could do a course in that that we would then offer. And then obviously 20s Fest is your ultimate space to kind of come together once a year, meet loads of friends who are in the same boat as you and also figure out your next steps with lots of talks and speakers and live music. Again, bringing the fun element into what, what would ordinarily probably feel like school. So that is our whole process going forwards. And we just hope to grow and grow along with the team that we're growing as well. We're based up in Liverpool. We strongly believe that like there should be more exciting things outside of just London. Of um, so we want to grow up there, but we hope to do a 20s Fest North and a 20s Fest South going forwards. Like obviously we're launching in the North and then we want to bring it to London and do that every single year and then grow and grow and grow for there. That is essentially, essentially the plan for. I love the way, actually, no, before I um, feedback on that, might we see a book? I would love to write a book. Yeah. We just put that out there. Or just absolutely. Yeah, any, any, it. yeah. Any publishers listening to this, I would love to write a book on, on your twenties and like everything that I've learned, because I feel like just a sponge of all these amazing people that I've met and it would be an absolute dream to write a book. Yeah. One yeah. Day, you must, hopefully. you must like know so much it, just from it, all the sometimes conversations. Feel like, yeah. Like it's wild. Like I feel like, and I was saying it on, on the podcast, I feel like a very 
well-rounded person. Like I feel like a much better person for sitting in front of all these amazing people, but with loads of different perspectives on life. Cause I can kind of go, that's my perspective, but I know that someone else would think differently like this. Mm -hmm. So it's just made me be like, okay, like the world thinks that everyone's, this is what we're all so different. We've all got polarizing opinions, but it's also really interesting to kind of have, see that from sitting on a sofa with all these amazing people. Yeah. Yeah. I hope, I hope the book happens. I'd love yeah. to read that book. Thank you. I hope it happens. This is a slightly, yeah. Um, like selfish question of me, but mm. yeah. So yeah, you're, you're like a seasoned podcast host. Mm -hmm. This is a, this isn't like a new podcast. I've done it. I've done a hundred episodes, but they were formerly um, Instagram live episodes. Do you have any tips on how to run a, mm -hmm. a good podcast like mm -hmm. things that you found have worked particularly well mm -hmm. I get asked this question a lot and I think it is ultimately down to the mission that you're building for your podcast mm -hmm. so why are people tuning in every single day and like really putting that listener journey first like what are they actually ultimately going to get out of listening to your episodes there's everyone every man and his dog has started a podcast it feels like in the past couple of years with the podcast there's, there's between three and five million yeah. on Spotify so it's just yeah. you you need to you can't listen to all of them. You basically. can't, you can't. And it's like, also, how do you, why, why your podcast? Like why are people going to tune into your, your episodes and stuff like that? And I think it's about really carving out what makes you different and why you exist first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Then obviously you can't start stepping into like the practical and the logistical side of running a podcast. We record all of our podcasts in person. I strongly believe that like the j j j j of Zoom is not cool. <laughs> like it isn't cool. Like yeah. nobody wants to listen to that through their speaker. Like yeah. the, I think our first episode that we did of the podcast was that because it was in the pandemic. But mm -hmm. as soon as we could step out of it, this is a much more authentic yeah. conversation. And you're, you're an events person yeah. initially. So yeah. So yeah. It's not cool. And so I strongly believe that if you can get people doing it in person, you'll, you'll increase your audience's like view, like view through rate because they're going to listen through rate because they're going to not be like going, oh, this is a bit of a dry conversation because where some, no one can jut in or you, you know, it's just, it's, it's not good. So good, strong audio. Um, if you can then step into the visual side of podcasting, which we do, we record and you are for your episodes as well. If you can then step into the visual side of podcasting, short form content is winning on social media right now. So creating clips from your episode that can essentially give a taster of what your podcast is about and get your message and your brand out there. So picking some clips that are really, that really frame your podcast, not just a random, a lot of clips can just go viral for viral sake, but really picking clips that kind of feed back into your story and, you know, pulling those from the episodes is, is extremely valuable because then you've got a way to kind of market the podcast. I think we all remember back in the day, like, did you ever see like a podcast advert when it was just like a, a wiggly audio line, gram, yeah. like an audiogram? Like, I, I don't know, but they never made me want to listen to a podcast. Me neither. So it's one of those things. Um, and then, yeah, grow, like getting your message out there as much as possible, getting interesting guests on board. Um, yeah, figuring out what makes you different, I think, is is the way to go. Thank you. They're all great tips. And that stuff you just said may well be a clip. <laughs> See, get really meta with it. Yeah. And I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to feed back on what you were saying before about when you're talking about your vision for Talk, for talk 20. Something I've always liked about you and your vision is that I think you really get it in terms of what you're creating because like, so like turning it into a festival mm -hmm. because the cool thing now, and I think the pandemic has got a little bit to do with this is that there's this, but also the wider environment we've been talking about where like the needs of young people just aren't being prioritized. Mm -hmm. I speak at money events and like the room will be full. It'll be like 70 people with paper and pen. Mm -hmm. They've all been at work. It's seven o'clock. They're there to listen to stuff about savings accounts and ISAs. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, oh, I'm competing with like other money events and stuff. I'm like, I'm competing with the pub, with the cinema, yeah. with like every other thing that this yeah. person could have done. And I think podcasts are the same thing. I think if someone's on the tube and they're on their way to work, they're like, how am I going to use this 30 to 60 minutes where I could listen to music or I mm -hmm. could stick on an episode of Talk 20s and I could better myself. And I think there's this huge appetite now for people to get more of an ROI on all of this technology that's being like shoved in our, mm -hmm. uh, shoved in our face. Mm -hmm. I also try and do it with my social media. I've got my Mr. Money Jar account, but I also have a, a personal one, which, which has like no followers or posts because mm -hmm. 
weirdly, I don't really use social media on a personal level, but I try and make sure the stuff that I follow on that is like in line with my goals. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. so it, when you're doing a personal scroll for your yeah, personal stuff, like, it's for, better for you. Yeah. Okay. That person's running, that person's doing a bit of stand-up comedy like that. So mm -hmm. I just, cause you spend hours, you look at your screen time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm the same actually I have a really really personal account that's completely like private and, mm. and uh, likewise like I think I post it like once a year um, and it just has people I genuinely have met from like in person and like have like either like people from school or family and it's like I follow absolutely zero influencers on that account I literally follow people that I know and would say hi to in the street because I think like another thing that social media can do is just throw you algorithmic things of like what it thinks you want to see and if you start following all of that you're going to see it and you miss out on all the yeah, the yeah. friends and stuff and you need to catch yourself and realize when you've been had by the algorithm like yeah. you watch a cat <laughs> once and then it thinks you want to watch every yeah. single dog cat. videos on yeah. my tiktok i mean i can't complain i love it but yeah 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 um there was one other question i wanted to ask you before asking you the question that we ask everyone mm -hmm. but it's um and you had dominic mcgregor we did yeah yeah talk 20s and we were talking a bit about the wider UK context and like politics and stuff. Mm -hmm. Politics has to evolve. Like it's clearly going to evolve. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future politicians and rule makers of the future will look like? Do you think like who do you think they'll be? And do you think they will be the sorts of people that might back a future 20s fest mm -hmm. vote for? I would really hope so. So I he, I don't know if we can say this, but you just mentioned Dominic McGregor then, but he came onto the Talk 20s podcast and he said one of his aspirations is to run for PM. Like that's what he wants to do. I would fully support that mm -hmm. because he comes from a background where he's actually a university dropout, which would be really interesting to kind of get in, in, into parliament. That would be so countercultural though, would, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it would yeah. be. He's a university dropout, obviously startup, found a social chain. And then now he stepped into like inve like invest investments and all that kind of stuff. So he runs a company called Fearless Adventures now. They invest in uh, mainly e-commerce um, companies. Um, so really, really interesting. If someone like him were to get into, into parliament, and then I really do think that, you know, we'd see a lot of change and stuff like that. But is there is the system set up to support and do that? I don't know. The one thing I will say is that he is currently working with, with government as 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 it is, you know, he runs a part of what they do at Phyllis Ventures is runs like the digital side of things where they help young people upskill um, in the digital skills and then send them off into like get them into different workplaces and stuff like that. He's already working with parliament in that kind of way and government and stuff. So there's, he's got an in, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I do think that we hopefully will see that because obviously we look back at like traditional prime ministers and they've all been schooled in the same locations mm -hmm. and the same schools. They've all come through and it's very, it's very easy to see that trajectory. Um, I also think it's really interesting if we had someone like Dom, like he, he's been through a really difficult time uh, in his early years and is yes. now completely, completely sober and yeah. talks a lot very openly about that journey as well. Be, I think it'd be really refreshing. And there's there's plenty of people like that out Dom, like Dom that could do something like that. And I'd yeah. love to see that going forward. Yeah, the cool thing about the space we're in now is when you look at our peer group, we're like you and I will be at least one degree separated from someone who is doing that sort of thing. So yeah. Dom comes to mind, Ben West comes to mind yes. with the campaigning yeah. he's doing around mental health. Tina Kerr, who mm -hmm. started the Five Times More campaign, mm -hmm. she regularly lob lobbies government. I saw her uh, last week and would love to get her on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Actually, you talking about that has made me really excited for how different the world yeah. will look. Because yeah. what I reckon will happen is someone like Dom will want to go in Mm -hmm. uni dropout whatever i think he's going to get a lot of pushback from the old school yes they'll be like well why haven't you i went to eaton so yeah, you need yeah, to yeah. but then the people on the ground who like know him and have followed him yeah. and supported him the whole time will just like vote him in yeah and they, I hope so, and they yeah. won't get it <laughs> yeah they'll be like yeah but like he yeah, is yeah. us like he gets us yeah i hope so and i think i think that would be great if that happened like moving forwards be, um yeah. i also think like it's a really I feel like really, this is why I say I feel really privileged to sit in the position that I do because like 
a lot of people, young people as well, like, don't get me wrong, like everyone that I speak to on the podcast will tell you, one of the questions we ask actually is like, what are you currently struggling with right now? So everyone, like no one has a perfect life. That's one of the things that we kind of really cement when we talk about talk 20s. A lot of people will listen to podcasts to one of our celebrities and they think, oh my God, their life must be amazing. But we ask them to specifically say on the podcast, one thing they're literally struggling with right now. Mm -hmm. So we bring that human element right back in, which is great because there's so many people who've come on and been really raw and honest with us. But also the connections that we then make, I then think I'm sat here, one, I'm listening to so many people's different perspectives of which none of them are perfect, but they're all pushing for amazing things. Some of them run businesses. Some of them run like amazing platforms that are educational. Some of them, you know, you'll see on our TV screens and stuff like that. It's, it's amazing. And I just think like, where will all of these people that have been on the Talk 20s podcast, where will they be in 10 years time? Because mm. I guarantee they'll be running the running the country. They'll be running the country if I don't not know the world. Who, I don't know who else it would be, yeah. Like, it, they, they are. Like, they're just, they're the people that are prepared to kind of speak up and, and make changes and stuff like that. So it makes me really excited when I think about it in that kind of way. Because I just have to let, like, look, 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line, all of these people would just imagine where, where they'll be if they're already kind of making great waves and stuff like that R reminder that none of them are perfect at the same time um you know so yeah it's an exciting time yeah and i also think the same thing about people like you like um one of the thing diary of a ceo streaming on bbc iplayer made me yeah. realize that if you run a podcast format then you essentially are running a tv show yeah so like we may have a talk 20s like spot on tv like oh my every god week, imagine imagine a millions tv of show we can rewind back these tapes and be like imagine yeah. a talk 20s tv show and we'll be like we spoke about it on yeah, the mr money jar show it. we should have manifested more yes on <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing like i think like making things mainstream and also like let's be honest like if we look at this gen z generation tv is not going to look the same in in 20 years time no, so no. actually a talk 20s tv show probably could exist but it won't be in the format that we imagine what a tv show looks like right now it might be like a, a like it just it will be it could be a netflix thing it could be a yeah. amazon prime or apple tv or Online whatever TV. they they then obviously launch that then exists because the world is going to change so much between now and then but yeah like a book a tv show radio i think in another life i'd be a radio presenter and welcome to the next song <laughs> well i mean but that that is podcast is yeah, yeah it's a it's yeah. a radio tv show um yeah, no, I, th I hope for the people listening to this that you, yeah, you have had the privilege of a Timmy and Gabby chat. Mm -hmm. I, I love, it's like I ask you a question and then you, you're like, well, I did that job. So here is a very comprehensive answer that only I could give you. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what's so awesome about <laughs> speaking to you. The um, question that we like to ask everyone on the show is, what is the best piece of money advice you've ever received? Mm -hmm. Who shared it with you and what did it teach you? Mm -hmm. Oh, a great question. I'm actually going to go down into like business owner life and step into something that's kind of sales and marketing -y actually. And it's more that like, as I've grown and like started a, like a, a business and stuff like that, I've always felt really icky about partnerships and, and selling, you know, because I just hate that word. So like, but obviously every business has to make money at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I think the same, in the same way, like also promoting yourself, no matter whether it's, you know, us trying to get more listeners on the podcast or you trying to um, post on LinkedIn because you're trying to raise your profile and stuff like that. It's actually more that like, stop thinking that 100% of your audience are seeing 100% of what you feel are like your sales posts, mm. because actually they're not. And it doesn't, and you'll probably think, well, how does that relate to money? And it usually means that like a lot of the time we don't go for things because we think, oh, I posted about that like three weeks ago. I'm sure everyone's seen that. I'm sure everyone knows. They don't know. They're not watching. They're more bothered about their own lives. It might be that you have to push a little bit harder for things in order to kind of get that opportunity or the outcome that you want, whether that's the job offer that you want, whether you're pushing for, you know, something you work in sales and you're really trying to push for that deal. You kind of do have to go through it more often than not. And like, that was something that I kind of learned and took away so that I was able to step into like, okay, like, you know, um, it's not an icky conversation. Like money is not an icky conversation, whether we're in business or in personal, you kind of have to just put yourself out there and really push forward with that. Because once I started realizing not 100% of people are seeing 100% of what I'm doing, it's like, oh, because otherwise it just feels like you're shouting into the abyss. And that's, I think like once I removed that, that was really positive for me. I don't know if that really relates to finance, but for me, like, I think that's helped me achieve everything, which is then obviously linked to money and yeah. It, of course, 100% relates to finance, but who shared it with you? Um, 
Or did you did you come up with it um, yourself? I so I, I feel like I learned it through uh, a mentor that I had in the industry. I'd seen like it like posted on social media, but I think I then lived through that exact meaning right. through the mentorship that I got. If that makes sense. So that is a nice way of summing it up. But it was a mentor that showed me like you need to just like I'd be like, oh, I don't want to. The post more people listen you know they've seen it surely they've seen this up and they're like actually no like they probably haven't they were probably like you know skipping past that or whatever like keep pushing yeah. and that's allowed me to get to where I am today um and I think that for whatever it is in your next goal whatever it is you want to do in your career or your personal finance like just stop thinking that 100% of the people that you you think are seeing it are actually seeing what you're putting out because they're not yeah I love that. And if I could build upon what you said, I know that you, I was going to mention this, you went to go see Harry Styles mm -hmm. last night. I'm a big video game fan. I grew up playing Nintendo with my brother. So whenever Nintendo announces anything, I get really excited. Yeah. And I think there's also, selling doesn't have to be a key because mm -hmm. if you sell from a place of love and from mm -hmm. a place of joy, then you're actually going to make a bunch of people really, really happy. Yeah. I really like the Legend of Zelda series, for example. And I know that if the people who were responsible for the Lord of the Rings films did a Legend of Zelda film, I'd lose my mind. <laughs> like I would, it would be two hours of me crying in yeah, the cinema. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, I'd yeah. be inconsolable. So if they were to sell that to me, great. Sold. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. sold. Yeah. Go there with my brother, have a great time. So yeah. start, start with joy, start with love. I love that. I love that. I think that's really good. Yeah. For the people who haven't listened to the Talk Twenties um, podcast before, mm -hmm. haven't seen your platform before, mm -hmm. where can they find you? On all social media platforms. So you can find us, if you want to listen to the podcast, you can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Just search for Talk Twenties podcast. And then you can follow us on socials at, at Talk Twenties. We spell it out, T-A-L-K-T-W-E-N-T-I-S, rather than two zero. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, and then you can find me as well. I am Gabby Mendez on most platforms as well. But yeah, thank you for having me. And also, sorry, one more. Can you drop any like initial info about Tony's Fest here as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's going to be taking place on the 1st of October in Liverpool. Yeah. And you can pre-register if you go to our website, talk20s.com forward slash 20s Fest. You can pre-register and you can help shape the event. So we've got a massive pre-register form there. I say massive, it literally takes two minutes to complete. <laughs> God, we haven't got you for like 20, 24 hours doing this form, but it's literally two minutes long, but you can actually tell us what you want to see at 20s first. So if you are really interested in making new connections, making new friends, you can tell, like, there's an option to click that on the form. If you really want to learn about career or you really want to learn about more finance, like all of that is there. Tell us what you want to see at 20s first and we're, we're creating it for you basically. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much Thank for coming. Thank you for having me. me. Appreciate Always good it. to speak to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you very much for watching this week's episode of the Mr. Money Jar Show. If you enjoyed it, then please do subscribe as it helps out the show a lot and enables us to continue running. Anyway, we'll be back next week with another special guest. I've been your host, Timmy Merriman-Johnson. <laughs>